Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Certainly glad to be able to join you today for a few moments as we discuss a portion of God's Word. In today's lesson, we're going to be looking at a portion of Scripture that is often overlooked. It's the turning of water into wine, found in John chapter 2. This miracle is often misapplied or overlooked as a minor miracle, and certainly it's not as awesome as raising someone from the dead, for instance. But yet, any miracle is a great miracle, and we should not just overlook it. This was the first recorded miracle of Jesus, although we're not sure whether it actually was the first one or not, but at least it's the first recorded miracle. The occasion was a wedding feast. A part of a wedding ceremony was a wedding feast usually held in the home of the groom, and of course he would be attended by many relatives and friends. Usually a servant or a friend would supervise the feast. In this case, it was held in Cana of Galilee. It was a small city about six or seven kilometers northeast of Nazareth. And you remember Nazareth was Jesus' hometown. That was the town in which uh, he was raised. Now, a wedding feast in the first century lasted several days, possibly even a week. And of course, during that time, a lot of wine would be drunk by the guest. But this shows that Jesus was not a hermit, that he engaged in all the, the feasting and all the social occasions of his day. As it says in Matthew 11, verse 19, he came eating and drinking. In other words, he lived pretty much like everybody else. He lived as a social character and involved himself in the social activities of his day. In this case, the emergency was a shortage of wine. We're not sure why it was short and it's not important as to exactly why they run short of wine. But it, this would have been an extremely embarrassing situation according to Eastern custom. Now, when Jesus talked to his mother and mother asked him if he would do something about it, then Jesus replied to his mother as just simply, Woman, my hour is not yet come. Now, to us, that sounds very harsh and indignant. Indeed, some people are quick to condemn Jesus for this unloving reply, we think. But there was nothing indignant or harsh about it, according to their custom. The same address is used, for instance, in John 19 and verse 26 on the cross when Jesus was talking to his mother and said, Woman, behold your son. Now, surely he was not being harsh and indignant to his mother on that occasion. And yet he used the same wording, same terminology. So it might seem harsh to us according to our standards, but we must be careful not to judge first century people by our standards because things were different then. They used different reasoning. They used different wording sometimes in their conversation to one another. Most people think that Christ is here indicating his independence of his mother as respecting his messiahship, in other words, the divine side of Jesus. In other words, he's gently pointing out to his mother that even though Mary was his mother, he had other obligations as far more important than his obligation to Mary. But at least he did do what Mary wanted him to do. He solved the situation. He may turn to water into wine. The miracle here was a transition of turning ordinary water to wine. According to chapter 2 in verse 9, that would have been about 120 gallons of wine. That was a whole lot of wine that Jesus made. Now, this miracle is one that is often misused and misapplied. People often miss the purpose of this miracle. 
Remember, especially in John, there's always a purpose of the miracles of Jesus. John only recorded seven miracles. Surely he had a purpose in including each and every one. And so he had a purpose in this one as well. We must not miss the purpose of it. But before we start talking about the purpose of this miracle, let's just briefly for just a moment point out that it's not necessary to assume that the wine here was alcoholic. You know, many people want to misuse this miracle and go to it and try to prove that we can drink alcohol on a social basis today because that's what Jesus did. And he turned water into wine, an alcoholic drink, so surely drinking alcohol is nothing wrong with it. Well, we need to warn uh, against such an interpretation of that. The word wine in the Bible is used over a hundred times, and it is a general term for either a fermented or unfermented beverage. Now, in our day and time, of course, the word wine always refers to an intoxicating drink, but that is not true in the Bible. The context will usually imply what kind of wine it is, whether it's intoxicating or not. In this particular occasion, it is difficult to determine from the context exactly what kind of wine that Jesus made. But when we consider other things, and I think we say to say that most likely it was not intoxicating. The unfermented wine is talked about in the Bible as a blessing from God. On the other hand, in several verses, we are warned against the, the fermented kind. For instance, in Proverbs 23, verses 9, 29 through 35, you might look at those verses for a warning against the intoxicating drink. Isaiah also con condemned the fermented kind, along with Galatians 5 and verse 19. According to chapter 2 and verse 10 of John, we find that the guests have already been well drunk. Now, that doesn't mean they were drunk as we think about the word drunk. It just simply means they had already drank a lot of wine. Now, if that wine was intoxicating and they'd already drank a lot of it, then that means then that it, at worst, uh, at best, they would have been a little bit tipsy, so to speak. Well, if they were already either drunk or well on the road to being drunk, why would Jesus serve another 120 gallons of alcohol to guests who are already drunk? Which would have been violation, of course, of the many Old Testament scriptures condemning drunkenness. You see, the most logical conclusion here is that Jesus made the unfermented wine, which was, of course, the common beverage of that day. But let's not, let's move along and just try to look at the purpose of this miracle. The purpose of it is stated in chapter 2 and verse 11, where there John said, This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and the disciples believed in him. The purpose of this miracle was to manifest or make plain the glory of Christ. The word glory means to praise, to honor, to beautify. In Psalm 19 in verse 1, it said, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Earlier, before this time, Christ's glory had been concealed. Christ was born as an ordinary baby in a very lowly pauper's uh, place, born in a poor family. But in this miracle, Jesus removes this cover of concealment, and he begins to manifest his glory. And the disciples' faith was strengthened. All the miracles of Jesus were designed to produce faith in his students. This miracle is connected to chapter 1. In chapter 1, at the end of that chapter, we find that Jesus called Philip and Nathaniel to be his apostles, his disciples. In verse 50, he says to them that you will see greater things than this. 
And then in chapter 2 in verse 1, it says on the third day. In other words, on the third day after the end of chapter 1, we find these things happening. So these things are connected then. This was undoubtedly the first of many greater things that his disciples were going to see. Well, what greater things does Jesus offer? In the Old Testament, wine was a symbol of abundant life. It was a symbol of luxurious blessings which God gives to his people. Well, through Christ, we also have great blessings being available. But these blessings are not temporary. They're not physical, much like the Old Testament blessings were. They are spiritual, but they have means they are eternal. They're much more valuable. Indeed, we will not be disappointed in following Jesus. Jesus said in John 10 and verse 10, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Through Jesus, we can have the abundant life, as we like to say. This miracle proves that Jesus was the master of quality. He gives the best quality of wine. He gives the best quality of life here as well as eternal life in the hereafter. You see, when Jesus gives something, it's always of the best quality. And here Jesus gives the best wine. The last statement of this miracle, the punchline as we might call it, emphasizes the quality of Jesus' wine. Immediately following this is the account of Jesus cleansing the temple. Most people try to connect these two, and I think very likely it would be, that this would be a reflection on the barrenness of Judaism. You see, the temple was a symbol of the presence of God. It was the place where the Jews came to worship God. And yet the temple had become like a den of thieves. Supposedly it was offered salvation, but in actuality it would deliver death. Because he could not bring about the forgiveness of sins which the Jews needed, and yet the Jews looked upon it as guaranteeing their salvation regardless of how they lived. Yet Jesus gives us the best wine. He gives us the best blessings. You know, many scholars see this miracle as an introduction to the great teachings of John chapter 3 and verse 4. Uh, John chapter 3 and chapter 4, rather where Jesus talked about the new birth that was taught to Nicodemus and the discussion of living water taught to the Samaritan woman. Indeed, this miracle may well have been understood by John's readers as a sign of Christ inaugurating a new dispensation of God. It was the coming of his kingdom represented by the wine. Water would represent the Old Testament covenant, that was the old covenant God had made with his people. But now God was bringing in a new kingdom, a new blessing, a new covenant, which represented by the wine, which was much superior to the old. And indeed, the new covenant is much superior to the old. We see this especially talked about in the book of Hebrews, for instance. The question we need to think about is, are we really seeking the good wine that Jesus offers? Are we really seeking that wine, seeking the covenant, the kingdom that Jesus inaugurated when he came to this earth? We can rest assured that following Jesus will result in great things, and we will see greater things even. And we will inherit greater things, and we can have the best life here, and certainly the best life in the hereafter. May we always try to seek these great things that Jesus promised us here at the very beginning of his ministry, the greater things that Jesus is going to bring to us. May we always look at this miracle and try to see the true purpose of it, and not get bogged down into the minor reference or the misapplying of this miracle as far as our whether we should drink wine, alcoholic beverage or not. May we always look to this for the true purpose. And of course, always strive to follow Jesus so that we can have the best things that Jesus offers. Thank you for your attention today. Be blessed by studying the Word of God. 
to receive the Voice of Truth International Magazine and to study the Bible systematically through our English Bible Correspondent Course. Kindly write to us. Our address, Gracious Word, P.O. Box 15. Our study Madurai 625016 Tamil Nadu. For more details, dial 9244204420, 9244214421. God bless you. The Church of Christ salutes you.